Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We're studying together in the Epistle to the Galatians verse by verse, and in our last study together, we were in the area of verses 2 and 3, looking at the gift of the Holy Spirit and our receiving the Holy Spirit. And what I tried to point out, and I'll not repeat what we did last uh, week, is that when God made us His own children, chose us as His own, He gave us the Holy Spirit. And there's a time when we recognize that and we receive it, but our receiving it doesn't make it true. We have been given the Spirit. The second and third verse emphasize the fact that this was a work of faithfulness not a work of law. The third verse, are ye so foolish or unthinking? It's the same word that's in verse 1. The Holy Spirit is not calling them fools or idiots or morons, but, but, but unthinking. Are you so unthinking, so illogical, that having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? And the words are dative. Having begun in the sphere of, the spirit, of the, the Spirit, are you now being made perfect in the sphere of the flesh? The word perfect is complete. It's present tense. But whether it's a passive voice or, or as translated in the authorized version or a middle voice depends on the translator's opinion. For example, you could translate this, you could translate it, are you so unthinking having made a start in the sphere of the Spirit, or having begun in the sphere of the Spirit, are you being made perfect in the sphere of the flesh? You could translate it that way. Or you could translate it, are you making yourself perfect in the sphere of the flesh? And the difference is the passive or the middle voice. I'm not, I am not enough of an expert to tell you which it is. I believe that the middle voice is more appropriate. Are you now making yourselves perfect in the area of the flesh? Isn't it amazing that someone who would agree that the flesh could not start the process would even be willing to infer that it might be able to finish it? Now, in all honesty, that's typical of the theology to which I was exposed for many years of my life. You know, that God did all that He could when He died on the cross for you, and it's up to you to finish it. And folks, that is a devastating piece of logic, and that's what the Holy Spirit is saying here. You're not thinking is it conceivable that the flesh could finish something that it couldn't start? And yet that is the preaching that I was exposed to for many years. Could be the same in your case. For many years, and the preaching that many, many people are exposed to today, God did something for you in a potential sense. You have to make it kinetic. You're the one that's going to finish it. And the Holy Spirit points out here how illogical that that is. If the flesh cannot start it, it surely can't finish it. You know, I'm sure you, you're familiar with the marvelous passage of Scripture in Hebrews that the Lord is the author and the finisher of our faith. He's, he is the one who began it and He is the one who will complete it. Okay, it's all Him. When we look at the Word of God, we have to realize, first of all, and I believe primarily, that God is not the product of our imagination or our design. God, folks, God is who He is. I've had several people in Bible classes that I've taught over the years who, in almost anger, said, you know, your God is not my God. Folks, I don't, I don't have a God. You don't have a God. God is God. Okay, He's not open to my design. 
God is not what I conceive him to be. God is God, and the only thing that I know about him is what he reveals. Can man, by searching, find out God? Em emphatically, no. Okay? God is known by revelation. If you want to know what kind of a God he is, it, it must be by revelation. That is his word. But it's important that we be consistent with the Word of God. The step that I do not want to make, dearly beloved, the step I do not want to infer, e even infer, is that if you don't do these things, you're headed for hell. I think without question, the great bulk of living Christians, that is, and by Christian, I mean those who are headed for heaven because God elected them, are not students of the Word of God. If you ask me in one sentence to describe the average Christian, I'd say that he's an individual who, who knows exactly what he believes and can't support it with the Word of God. I do not believe, well, let me phrase it differently. If you could postulate someone who is absolutely consistent in the Word of God, knows all of the nuances of, of theology, makes absolutely no contradictory opinions concerning theological doctrine, that person would be ideal in my mind and, and would be a far cry from God Himself. Folks, dear, listen, from, from the stupid of us to the most brilliant of us is nothing compared to the gap between us and God. I guess what I'm trying to say is that I believe because we love Him, we want to know who He is. Because we love Him, we want to know what He does. In particular, what He's done for us, and that's why we study this book. I do not believe you study the Word of God because you're earning heaven or, or getting merit points with God. If you do not love Him enough to want to study and to find out all that you can about Him, then that is between you and the Lord. The reason the Scriptures are taught on this channel verse by verse is because we here at Blessed Hope Forever believe absolutely, we absolutely believe that this is a revelation from God Himself. And therefore, it's very, very precious. Nothing we could possess holds a candle to the value and the wonder of the Word of God. It isn't easy. It's never easy. But it is a thrill to dig and to find precious truths concerning our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I believe to a great extent the Word of God is demeaned when much of the preaching is telling you how to live. If ever I were to choose texts to tell you how you ought to live your life, it would always be based on my opinion, the way that I think life ought to be lived. And that's bad. That's very narrow. This book is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Contrary to much that I read and, and hear today, it is not a book on how you invest your money or how you ought to handle your money or how you ought to control your kids or, or how you ought to be you know, with your parents. Those are only incidental things. This book is a revelation of Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I believe it takes a bit of work. I think that you can look at the sixth verse and see what I'm trying to say about the third verse. Even as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Okay? Now, verses like that have bothered people down through the years. Uh, Luther, for one. You could read that verse that because Abraham 
in the, the frailty and the depravity of his flesh, he decided to believe God, and then God then accounted righteousness to, to, to Abraham based upon his belief. Abraham became righteous because he believed God. You not only could read it that way, but most of your friends probably do read it that way. And I believe that this is a beautiful illustration of why we should search the Scriptures. It bothered Luther, for example, that James would say, we therefore see that Abraham was justified by works. So Luther, among many others, concluded, he basically reached the conclusion that James was not an inspired book and it shouldn't be included in the canon even though he was, he was head of the church at Jerusalem. And the problem, I believe, is that we're not willing to accept all that God has said. The analogy of Scripture, comparing Scripture with Scripture. The, the word legizomai, imputed there, that's the Greek word legizomai. It's a word that means to compute by logic, count it as a true fact. Some call it a bookkeeping term. Okay, now, now let's put a column of figures here, all right? Let's say I had uh, two plus two. Now, a generation ago, we have no problem. Everybody knew that that was four. Today, I think if it feels good, it could be five, eight, you know, nine, you know, as long as it, whatever, as long as it feels good to you. If I said to you logically, compute that, and you say, well, that's four, does that make it four because you logically added that column of figures and got the correct answer? Does that make the answer correct? No, no. No, you've put the cart before the horse. Somehow you mixed it up. The fact that you got the right answer doesn't make it the right answer. And that's the thing people miss. Ask me what changed my life. And I'll tell you folks, the, the thing that most affected my life was when I found out that life, spiritual life, comes before faith. Life precedes faith. What a wonderful truth. And that's the truth of, of the Word of God. Spiritual life comes before faith. Abraham believed God and it was imputed to him it was accounted to him for righteousness. Legizomai, the logical conclusion is he was righteous. Did his faith make him righteous? No. No. Yeah. Just like you saying two plus two is four, don't make it four. When you got the right answer, you showed it to, to be the right answer, but it, was, it always was the right answer. You didn't make it the right answer. Okay? That verse of Scripture does not say that Abraham was made righteous because he believed God. It does say that the logic is that he was righteous because he believed God. Genesis 15, 6. Chapter 15, verse 6. And he believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. Now, that's what the Holy Spirit is quoting in Galatians chapter 3. We could read Genesis 15, 6, that Abraham believed in the Lord and the, and the Lord clearly, clearly the Lord counted it to him for righteousness. And we could read that the same way we read in Galatians that because he believed he was made righteous. But, Go back up with me, if you would, to the first verse. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. Look at Isaiah 51. Hearken to me, Ye that follow after righteousness, ye that 
Seek the Lord. Look unto the rock whence ye are hone, and to the hole of the pit whence ye are digged. Look unto Abraham, your father, and unto Sarah that bear you. For I called him alone, and I blessed him, and I increased him. Now the rock in verse 1 is Christ. The pit is Abraham in Ur of the Chaldees, an idol worshiper. For I called him alone. Go over to Romans chapter 8. Romans the 8th chapter. For, for whom he did foreknow them, he also did predestinate conform to the image of his Son. And whom he did predestinate, he what? Called. And all those whom he called, he justified. That is, made righteous. So now we have the testimony of Scripture that the first thing that happened to Abraham was a call. Why? Because he was foreknown and he was predestinated. And he fits exactly into the pattern of Romans chapter 8, 8 uh, verse 29 on, from there on, because he was, for, he was foreknown. And it's prognosco because he was known intimately ahead of time. He was predestinated, predetermined. And because he was predetermined, he was called and he was called alone. God didn't call his, his dad, didn't call his brothers, didn't call his family. Called Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees. Why did he just call Abraham? I mean, that doesn't, that doesn't seem fair to the rest of his family. He called him, folks, because the lesson for us is that God deals with us individually and when he called him, he justified him. It's no wonder Abraham believed God. Abraham believed God and was shown to be righteous. You added two plus two, and it was shown to be four, but it didn't make it four. It was always four. So you didn't make it what it was. It was shown to be what it was. And Abraham is a beautiful picture of our election. And that's going to be the point of our immediate study for the next couple of weeks. If you're tired of hearing that, I'm sorry. That's, that's, I can't get around it. In Galatians, Abraham was not circumcised in order to be made righteous. He was circumcised as an outward sign of what was already inwardly true. So Abraham under the law was not Abraham under grace. Abraham, under grace, was foreknown, predestined, called, and made righteous. That's four things. And it's because he was made righteous, he believed. The old man could not believe. Why do you not believe my speech? Because you cannot hear my words. If you were my sheep, you would believe. Those are powerful verses, folks. The problem is, Thousands, I'm going to say thousands upon thousands of Christians read those verses and they say, yeah, yeah, that's true. And when they read Galatians 3.6 or Genesis 15.6 or James chapter 2 and, and take a directly opposite opinion that it's works that makes you righteous. <laughs> now that's the thrust, that's the thrust of our argument here in Galatians. It seems apparent that these people were God's children. Of course they were His. We're looking at the intended audience. I mean, who, having begun in the Spirit. That's God's children. Okay. Now I recognize we could come up with some small debate as to whether or not that means that they were redeemed, but I think that the, the general conclusion is that these were God's children. And God worked a work of grace in their hearts and in their lives. How could they then depart from that work of grace back to law? I, how many times people have t said to me, well, God imputes honor or righteousness to those who try. You've got to be kidding me. I need a verse for that. 
Not by trying, but by my Spirit, saith the Lord. Are you so unthinking that Christ is the author of your faith and you're trying to be perfected of it? You who couldn't even start it, you expect to finish it? You know, there are a lot of problems with merit. Suppose it were true. Suppose God had somehow ordained that once He made us new creations in Christ Jesus, our redemption was at least in part due to how much we did. What do you think heaven would be like? How in the name of creation did, did oh, what's his name ever get here? <laughs> heaven would be a mess. The only way any one of us is going to spend one second in eternity is the grace of God. One of the lessons we're told in Isaiah that we must learn is that salvation is of the Lord. It's not of the law. It's not of works. And righteousness is of the Lord. Nobody is there based on merit, but on the finished work of Jesus Christ. Had you suffered so many things in vain, if it yet be, if it be yet in vain? You know, big question on the fourth verse. Where's any evidence that they suffered? Well, you know, there are a few verses in Acts uh, chapter 12, I believe, that indicate that some persecution uh, was took place in the area of Galatia, but I think that the verse is referring to the fact that from the legalistic standpoint, if first of all they began in the Spirit, they are immediately criticized by the legalist and by legalism and by responsibility. And folks, when it comes to responsibility, I've, I've told you over and over, I, I believe you have responsibilities as a child of God and you must keep that clearly in mind, but you have no responsibility to be redeemed. None. Zilch. Okay? You do have responsibilities once you are redeemed because you are God's child and the present context is dealing with redemption. Fellowship with God in redemption. And that is not, not, not based on human merit. It's not based on human works. It's not based on human responsibility. And so they began in the Spirit, which means they were under persecution from the legalists. And it can, and it can be serious persecution for most of you uh, to suffer any persecution in the name of Christ. It will come. That persecution will come. And it will come from the Christian community. Now that may change. I don't know. It's up to the Lord. I believe God is judging this nation as He declares that He will. It may be that the civil government will become your, your great enemy. But as of the moment, the great persecutor of the Christian who, who is abandoned to the grace of God is the organized religious system, that legalistic system based on human merit. And I believe that that was the basis of their suffering. And was, all, was that all wasted? Was that wasted? Was that empty? Was that in vain? If it be yet in vain is the translator's idea of the, of the closing Greek. I think what the Holy Spirit is saying is, no, no, it wasn't all in vain. It could not have been in vain. He therefore, verse 5, and that has to be God. That is not Paul. That is, that is not the local minister. He therefore that ministers to you, the Spirit, and works miracles among you, doeth He it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. Dearly beloved, you have to decide whether that's the Holy Spirit or, or whether that's spiritual truths. The translators of the authorized version obviously conclude it's the Holy Spirit. It is articulated. In many cases where the word is articulated, it's natural to assume that it's the Holy Spirit. I believe it's the Holy Spirit here. That's, that's what I, I'm going to suggest. It's the Holy Spirit. God who supplies the Holy Spirit to you and works miracles among you the word miracles is not the normal word 
for signs or miracles, it's dunamis, the Greek word for power, for might. So we could say that he that works mightily among you, does he do that by works of the law or by the hearing of faith? And both of these are genitive, genitives, by law's works or by faith's hearing. In what way does God work powerfully in your life? God is asking you this. I don't know how to really put into words what it means to be able to realize that it's God who's working in you both to will and to do of His good pleasure because we hold so tenaciously to the things that we consider to be dear and precious. God wants you to be able to walk with confident trust that it is He who's working in you both the will and to do of His good pleasure. Now He that ministers that Spirit to you and works powerfully among you, what is more powerful to, to take with trust and rest and confidence great conflict in your life or to work frantically searching and digging and, and flailing about flopping around like a fish out of water, you know, trying to solve it. I mean, which is the most powerful, folks? What a marvelous experience to walk as a child of God in this environment. Don't get the idea that because He owns the cattle on a thousand hills and He's the God who spoke the worlds into existence that everything ought to just be all hunky-dory. You know, I, we, use, we say hunky-dory here. All, all milk and honey, okay, for you. If God did that, He wouldn't really be much of a God because he, he, it'd spoil you rotten. Why doesn't He have the right to do with us as He chooses? Why can't He take a guy like Job and make him a testimony for generation after generation of His, of his faithfulness and trust in God? Would you stand before God and say, you know... Lord, you had no right to do that in my life. And God could say, well, you know, well, look, how, look how many lives were touched by what I did in your life. I've always been amazed for many years now how tenaciously people hang on to this life. I look around at how distant mankind is to God. And how that their world is full of grief and sadness. I don't know about you people, but heaven looks awful good to me. And I've said to you, you folks before, you know, you pray me out of heaven and I will haunt you. I love the Lord with all my heart and He can do with me as He pleases. He that works powerfully among you, does He do that through the law? No, no. The answer has to be emphatically, no. He does it by the faithfulness of hearing. The hearing or trust or trust hearing or, or however you want to translate it. It's a genitive. And we get to our sixth verse. In the same way in which Abraham believed God and was shown to be righteous... It didn't make him righteous any more than 2 plus 2 is made to be 4 because you added it that way. It just It is what it is. And it's shown to be that when you logically compute it. If we look at Abraham's life, it's amazing what God did with him. Went down into Egypt, uh, came, came up out of Egypt, and yet when we look at it from this perspective, many, many years later, the powerful things that God did in Abraham's life, I, I don't know what God is working in your life, folks. What I do know is that it is of His good pleasure. And what Abraham is working in your life is going to show you to be righteous. We can't take Romans chapter 5 and just throw it out. You know, by the disobedience of the one, the many became sinners. And by the obedience of one, the many became righteous. By the obedience of Christ, you were made righteous. You're not made righteous by 
your obedience. You are made righteous by the obedience of Christ. So was Abraham. So was Isaac. So was Jacob. Abraham was foreknown. Folks, imagine us being foreknown in the counsel of God. You know, you really have to grasp the word foreknown. And it, it isn't that he's, he's looked at your life and said, you know, yeah, yeah, man, not too bad. You know, this guy he didn't, think, didn't think you'd make it as far as you did. Maybe I ought to choose you. You know, that is not the way that God knew us. He not only knew us beforehand as, as he knew Isaac before Isaac was ever born, now ye brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. Before you're ever born. He didn't, he didn't know us intellectually. It's not oida, it's prognosco. He knew us intimately. He knew us intimately ahead of time, and therefore he predestined us because we were his own. There are verses of Scripture that I think people just, just studiously avoid. Those who were born after the flesh, these are not the children of God. I did not do this. An enemy has sown the, the tear. This is God speaking. We are His children. Not only did He foreknow us, He predetermined us. You can argue with Him if you want to. I, you know, I will say, you know, you're, maybe you're not pretty enough, you're not handsome enough, you're not tall enough, thin enough, fat enough, smart enough. I don't know what the, I don't know what the complaints are. Dearly beloved, no matter what is going on in your life, God predetermined you. That's what the book says. God predetermined you and then He called you. Now the interesting thing is our reference in Romans says, and it's, it's clearly inferred in the text, all that He called, He justified. And that, jive, that just jibes exactly with the words of, of our Redeemer. All that the Father hath given unto me shall come unto me, and I shall lose what? None. None. It's a marvelous thing to walk with the Lord. It's exciting. Dearly beloved, rest in the Lord. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge Him and He will direct your paths. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we just come into Your presence once again by means of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So thankful for Your Word. My prayer is, our prayer is that You would filter out all of that which is foolish. Seal to our hearts the truth of your word that we may grow in grace and knowledge of you. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. I love you all. I truly do. Thank you for watching.